Delegates, it's my great pleasure now to introduce the main event of our conference, the address by the main man, uh, the speech to conference by our First Minister, Alex Salmond. Now, when I introduced Alec to the conference back in October, I was able to announce to you uh, that he'd just been awarded the South Australia International Climate Change Leadership Award. Since then, the First Minister has won the Herald Politician of the Year Award, the UK, the UK Political Studies Association Politician of the Year Award, the Spectator Magazine's Politician of the Year Award, and the Best Politician Award at the Scottish Green Energy Awards. Now, you guys thought I used to have a tough time keeping his feet on the ground, didn't you? <laughs> But then after all of that, on the 27th of December last year, our First Minister was awarded the Times 2011 Britain of the Year Award. <laughs> but I think it's part of my job to bring his feet back down to earth. So I'm going to remind him today that he's in Glasgow, the great city of Glasgow. And in Glasgow, you're nothing until you've won the Evening Times Award. <laughs> Delegates, our First Minister is a worthy, extremely worthy recipient of all of these awards. He has led our party to unprecedented success. But even more importantly than that, he's brought the independence debate to life and he has put our country centre stage. Delegates, he is our leader, he is Scotland's First Minister. I ask you now to welcome to the stage with rapturous applause, the First Minister, Alex Salmond. Well, Delegate, speaking to you now as Britain of the Year. <laughs> you, know, you know, Delegates, uh, some of you who've been going to these conferences even longer than I have, have probably noticed that we swapped the, uh, the speeches from uh, the leader and the deputy leader. Uh, I used to speak on the Sunday, Nicola used to speak on the Saturday. And we turned them around basically because I felt if I had to introduce Nicola on the Sunday, that would temper what she said about me on the Saturday. <laughs> Yeah, another great idea bites the dust. Eh? <laughs> but delegates, uh, we also remember that almost a year ago to the day, uh, I stood in this very stage uh, and spoke to you about Scotland's future. We were behind in the polls, the press didn't give us a chance, but we believed in our cause. Uh, I said if we worked hard, if we earned the trust and support of the people, then by working together, we could make the nation a stronger, fairer, uh, and better place. Just a few short weeks later in the Scottish election, the Scottish people placed their trust in us, and they did so in record overwhelming numbers. <laughs> so friends, every action we've taken as a, a government since then has been about repaying that trust honouring our commitment to the people. Today, in every town, every community, we are working as never before to make Scotland the country we all know it can be. Building recovery, creating opportunity, working for a Scotland that can truly prosper, the strong economy and the just society. And what a difference those extra SNP votes have made the special votes, the ones which built us an absolute majority in a proportional parliament. This time last year, we, we had just passed our final budget as a minority government. 
Our plans scraped through despite the opposition of the Labour Party. Back then, Labour opposed, and they almost stopped, our plans for 25,000 modern apprenticeships. They rejected and almost defeated our plans to protect family budgets with the council tax freeze to keep our streets safer with 1,000 extra police officers. A Labour Party, yes, a Labour Party, voting against work and training for young Scots. You know, once upon a time it said delegates at Labour were the People's Party, but delegates in May of last year, the people spoke and they chose Scotland's party. <laughs> but what a difference a year makes. Now, the difference is not in the nature of the Labour opposition we face. If we say black, Labour will still insist it's white. If I was to say that the sky was blue, then Labour in the Parliament would say, no, it isn't, eh? As we move forward, they will still do everything they can to hold Scotland back. Even now, even in this year's budget, they couldn't help themselves. They voted against the 25,000 modern apprenticeships again. They voted against the council tax freeze again. They voted against the extra police officers again. Conference that the Labour Party currently want every single family in Scotland to pay hundreds of pounds more in council tax. Despite the, the pressure on family budgets, the length and breadth for this country, everyone is to pay hundreds of pounds more according to Labour. Except in the case of Stirling Council, where they voted with the Tories to reduce it by 23 pence a week. That's right, a whole 23p. At the same time, they voted with the Scottish Tories in the Scottish Parliament uh, against the freeze. You know, the only consistent thing about Labour in Scotland right now is they vote with the Tories at every opportunity. That's why the people of Scotland vote against Labour at every opportunity. <clears throat> And just as last year's election took away the power of the Labour Party to block progress across Scotland, so too can the upcoming elections in May. The people can call times up on Labour's local fiefdoms. And if there's any place that needs relief from a Labour Party that's lost its way, it is this city of Glasgow. Friends, Scotland can flourish and Glasgow will flourish with the SNP. Well, I guess last year I, I spoke of Glasgow from this platform and the influence that uh, it has, which has stretched uh, across the globe. First as the workshop of the, the empire, and now as a creative city building a new empire of the mind. I announced a £90 million investment, government and private sector working together in Strathclyde University's International Technology and Renewable Energy Zone. ITRES is what they call it. That was a substantial announcement at the very cutting edge of the Green Revolution and the knowledge economy. Combining Scotland's greatest strengths, our environment, our people and our education. It was a promise, a signal of better days to come. A first step in the green reindustrialization of this city and of our country. It is a project that is already bearing fruit. Today, one year on, I can tell you there are already 100 jobs directly linked to the Innovation Center. 100 high skill, high value jobs, jobs in this city that will keep Scotland at the forefront of green energy research and create opportunities across this nation. And that, delegates, is just the start. At ITRES, we can expect a further 600 high-skill, high-value jobs will be created in the years to come. <laughs> and that's just one investment among many in recent months. North, South, East and West, TACA, Avalok, Samsung, and many more. Energy, finance, engineering. 
international companies making Scotland their home, combining with Clyde Blowers, the Wood Group, PSN, Global Energy, Scottish companies making the world their oyster. Jobs and opportunities, that is the SMP priority. Last December, we appointed a Minister for Youth Employment, Angela Constance, uh, the first such appointment anywhere in these islands. Angela has an additional budget of £30 million and a clear instruction to do all that she can to improve the, the life chances of young Scots. We have a clear commitment to all of our young people who yearn to be productive. No young person should go through school only to become and stay an unemployment statistic at the age of 16. We will not allow that in Scotland. That's why we've delivered 300,000 training opportunities since 2007, including those record 25,000 modern apprentices. Apprentices, each and every single one of them in Scotland, linked to a real job. Now, friends, these 25,000 apprenticeships aren't just for one year. They are for every single year of this parliament. And we are taking forward Opportunities for All, an initiative that will see every single 16 to 19 year old in Scotland offered a training or a learning place if they're not already in a job, a modern apprenticeship or full-time education. But more can and more must be done. Today I can announce a, a £5 million package which will ensure a further 2,500 young people are given the right support to help them towards the world of work. This will engage young people in volunteering opportunities in the international and national events Scotland will have the privilege to host over the next three years. Let me be clear, Conference. This government's commitment to our young men and women is unwavering. We intend to create the conditions in this land which will see a life opportunity for every young Scot. Friends, this conference is about progress. It's about Scotland moving up a gear. It's about the path and the opportunities that lie ahead. In this land of possibilities, in this Scotland, we have much to look forward to. In a little over two years, this city will host the Commonwealth Games and preparation, preparations continue to be on track and on budget. Construction began last summer in the Athletes' Village, which will accommodate over 6,500 competitors. And once the games are done, that great facility will be used to provide affordable homes for local families. Around this very conference venue, delegates, around this venue today is being built the Scottish Hydro Arena, the venue for netball and gymnastics during the games. The arena will seat 12,000 people. It will become one of Europe's busiest venues and contributing an estimated £130 million annually to the Scottish economy. No longer will we be turning away big acts like Barbara Streisand and Beyonce. <laughs> Indeed, if this party keeps growing at its current rate, we may need that venue for our own annual conference. Now, as First Minister, I'm uh, committed to ensuring that we make these games the greatest sporting event our country has ever seen. And I look forward to the Commonwealth Games, not only because Scotland competes in their own right, but also because I know they put Scotland on a global stage where we belong. In 2014, our light will shine for the world to see through the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup, the second homecoming year. But as well as having great ambitions for Scotland's sporting stars in the 2014 Games, this government has great aspirations for the event to be a catalyst for economic and social regeneration, with real benefits for communities and individuals, for our society as a whole. And that's why I'm delighted today to announce a new legacy initiative, <clears throat> the establishment of a £10 million fund that will allow communities to bring the local sports facilities across Scotland into the 21st century. Whether it be the renovation to a community hall, re of a bowling green, 
or even a new multi-purpose sports field. Our aim is to inspire Scots young and old to seize the opportunity presented by the Games and its legacy to become a better nation. Yes, uh, these are exciting times for Glasgow. Jobs are coming. The Commonwealth Games are coming. And as far as May's local elections are concerned, the SNP are coming. The Delegates 2014 will see another significant event for Scotland. In January, the Prime Minister tried to lay down the law and dictate the terms of Scotland's referendum. But I've got a message for Messrs Cameron, Clegg and Miliband. The days of politicians in London telling Scotland what to do and what to think, these days are over. Delegates, of course, we should thank the uh, Prime Minister. <laughs> After his intervention, SNP membership has surged <laughs> up over 2,400 in the weeks that followed. As Robert Burns might have said, the best laid schemes of mice and the Tory party aft gangagly. <laughs> and friends, this support will continue to rise because home rule with independence beats Tory rule from Westminster any time and any day. <laughs> because delegates, there is a, a simple and winning truth about independence. It is fundamentally better for our nation if decisions about our future, about our success, are taken by the people who care most about Scotland. That is, and always will be, the people who live in Scotland. We have the, the greatest stake in our, our nation's well-being. In good times or bad, it is the people of Scotland who will work hardest and care most. No one will do a better job than the people living here. With the people of Scotland in charge, speaking with our own voice, reflecting our own values, our own priorities, we will make our country better. That is our message of hope for this nation. <laughs> and what a contrast with the London party's message of fear. They want to, to knock Scotland's confidence, Scotland's self-belief. They seek victory through negativity. The friends, they're not even very good at that. <laughs> Since David Cameron's blunder into Scotland's constitutional debate, we've been treated to some very bizarre contributions from the anti-independence parties. William Hague said that the British embassies would no longer promote Scotch whiskey, according to the Daily Mail. But you know, friends, I, I dug a little deeper and discovered that Mr. Haig actually charges the Scottish Government every time we hold a Scotch whisky reception. <laughs> then the Daily Mirror reported a, a threat to take away our pandas. <laughs> but don't worry, Chin Chin, Yang Wang will be staying in Scotland. I've decided to offer them political asylum. <laughs> Reflecting, of course, that the United Kingdom government didn't contribute a single RMB uh, to the panda's arrival in our capital city of Edinburgh. Friends, the people of Scotland have got wise to these scare stories. It was a Westminster tactic tried before to stop devolution. It failed then because the people of Scotland saw it for what it was, empty, hollow, negative scaremongering. It failed then and it will fail now.
because we know the achievements that have been made with the, the power that Scotland already has. We have seen the progress as a country that's been made in those areas where our nation already has some independence. In our National Health Service, record low waiting times, record high satisfaction with the job our health professionals do, prescription charges abolished. Nye Bevan once said that uh, no society can legitimately call itself civilized if a sick person is denied medical aid because of lack of means. It is in that spirit the SNP and government continues to protect frontline health spending, despite the Westminster cuts and despite the huge pressures on our budget. Friends, with the people of Scotland in charge of Scotland's health service, we can choose and have chosen a different path, a path that reflects Scotland's social democratic consensus, our shared progressive values, our priorities as a society. A Tory Prime Minister once told us there was no alternative to her policies. On the health service, we are showing our friends in England that there is an alternative. And let me be absolutely clear, because of the independence we have over Scotland's National Health Service, this government, this SNP government, will ensure that Scotland's National Health Service is never for sale. And in education, I uh, remember back in, in 1979, well, of course, I was just a babe in arms then. <laughs> but even as a babe in arms, <laughs> I remember that way back then that some of the, the foremost skeptics about devolution were in our universities. But is there anyone now on the campus, a student or an academic, who would rather that the Tories were in charge of our universities? If they were, if they were run from London, free education would be a thing of the past. Public funding would be slashed. Tuition fees would today be creating an insurmountable barrier for thousands of young Scots, a barrier to aspiration and to talent. Our universities are a huge international success, five in the world's top 200, more research papers per head than virtually any other nation on the face of this planet with the protection and independence that we as a Scottish Parliament have given them from the Philistines of Whitehall. <laughs> so conference, with even just a, a taste of independence, we've been able to deliver fairer policies than elsewhere in these islands in higher education and in further education. Of that, we should rightly be proud. As a party, as a government, we will never kick away the ladder of opportunity, never put a price on learning that undermines the value of learning. The Tories' decision to, to scrap the educational maintenance allowance is part of that same agenda, an agenda that Scotland rightly and completely and roundly rejects. And just as our parliament stood firm against tuition fees, so we stand full square behind the educational maintenance allowance and in favour of proper support for our college students. For 35,000 young Scots, with the SNP, the educational maintenance allowance is here to stay. Delegates, progress in our National Health Service and education in creating safer communities. Earlier this week, official statistics were published showing 17,343 police officers in Scotland. For the fourth year in a row, the SNP government has delivered and protected the thousand extra police officers in our communities. A truly remarkable achievement given Westminster government's funding cuts, and one, of course, which the Labour Party said would take us 13 years. In this, another area of public life, where we have an element of independence, we can choose a better way. 
as we work to keep the police officers in our communities, delivering a 35-year low in recorded crime and a fear of crime that continues to fall. Down south, they, they look to privatize, yes, privatize key police functions, investigating crime, detaining suspects, and even patrolling neighborhoods. Additional functions of the police now open, not just to the highest bidder, but to the lowest common denominator. And now the United Kingdom government's own figures reveal that England will see a 16,000 reduction in the number of police. Conference, the contrast is very clear. More bobbies in the beat in Scotland or cuts to coppers under Cameron. <laughs> so if a measure of independence, on health, on education, and law and order, we've made Scotland a better place. Think what we could do with Scottish control of the economy, of international representation, and of our security. Right now, our economy needs capital spending and bank lending. We have already sent a list of shovel-ready projects to London. We demand that they are now redeemed. A small and medium-sized business sector needs finance. We have major banks largely in the public sector. Why are they not instructed to lend to force the pace of economic recovery? <laughs> of course, we now know from the official figures from last year that with control of our own finances, Scotland would have been 2.6 thousand million pounds better off. 510 pound for every man, woman and child in this country. Money which could have been used to invest in the economy, to reduce borrowing or to save for the future. In a devolved Scotland, we can demand. In an independent Scotland, we can deliver. On international representation, why would we wish to be isolated and ignored in Europe when we could be influential and respected? On defence, why would this nation of five million people elect to waste billions on weapons of mass destruction while we still have thousands waiting for a decent home and a life chance? Independence, friends, means real security. Westminster would spend on nuclear weapons which could destroy the world. Scotland should spend on social provision which could be the envy of the world. <laughs> friends, our, our task is nothing less than to transform Scotland, to change our nation for good. At the local elections in May, we can take the, the next steps on that journey. Elect a strong team of SNP councillors who will put their communities first. Conference, these elections are about local services. Help for hard-pressed families with the council tax freeze. Safer streets and keeping the thousand extra police about giving our unpaid carers more of the, the support that they need. Every vote for the SNP is a vote to build recovery with investment in new homes and new schools, investment in jobs and training. We hear and we understand the pressures individuals and families are facing across our nation. And step by step, we will deliver. We will use the powers that we have today and together. We will make Scotland better. That's right and, and good in itself. But friends, it is more. It is a statement of intent. It's a signal of the nation we can be and we will be with the powers of independence. For parents, for young Scots, we know what our nation must be with world-class childcare. And we know how we can get there. Already new investment in children's centres through the, the Sure Start Fund. A retargeting of resources through the Early Years Fund. And at these elections, 
a new step forward. We as a party have long cherished the ambition to increase preschool education. In our first term, we, we moved from 412 hours to 475 hours free preschool per annum, benefiting 100,000 children a year. Now we intend to move further and to place it in statute so that families in every part of Scotland can share in that benefit. Conference, we will place into the new children's bill introduced to Parliament next year a statutory guarantee of over 600 hours of free nursery education for every Scottish three and four year old. For every Scottish three and four year old and for every looked after two year old in our land. The best package of free nursery education on offer anywhere in the United Kingdom. A statement of faith and commitment to the future. Flexible in its delivery. Using the wisdom of the early years task force to help us but definite in our intent. For every young mum or dad juggling work and parenthood, the message is clear. The SNP is here for you and for your family. Friends, the SNP is here to build a fairer Scotland. My ambition is to reduce inequality, to give all Scots a fair chance in life. Across the world, the evidence is clear. The more equal a society, the better it is for all of us. I want a Scotland where a fair wage is a living wage, where work pays, and that is what we can achieve with independence. We have taken the first steps already. Every employee of the Scottish Government, the National Health Service and our agencies guaranteed from this year at least a living wage of £7.20 an hour. Two-thirds of the thousands who have benefited shall be women. Delegates, where we have the power, we shall act. I can announce today that every single SNP-led council elected in May will also introduce the living wage. Thousands more, thousands more of our lowest paid workers will receive fair pay and fair play with the SNP, putting more money in their pockets, putting more money to boost the local economies as we build towards a Scotland that is a living wage nation. <laughs> Conference, by our deeds we have been known and by our deeds we shall be known. If we make the right choices for our universities and for fairness and for families, who can doubt that we will also make the right choices on the economy and on Scotland's place in the world? Scotland's social democracy can survive, it can flourish, but only where we have the power. We can be a beacon for social justice, but only if we allow that light to shine. Delegates, the lesson is a simple one. A little independence has been good for Scotland, but real independence will be even better. <clears throat> so let us uh, set out the task that lies before us. We have to put the vast resources of this country to work for the benefit of the people. Creating a competitive economy and in doing so, creating new opportunities and new jobs. Saving and investing our offshore energy wealth as a guarantee of a safer and secure future. Scotland not just a, a nation of promise, but of potential fulfilled. Standing taller in the world, speaking with our own voice, a partner for justice and a partner for peace. Friends, these things and more are just a, a yes vote away. When the uh, United Nations were formed, there were just over 50 independent countries in the world. Today that figure has risen to almost 200. 
Some still say independence is difficult, but conference, these numbers don't lie. Of the 10 countries that joined the European Union in 2004, a majority have become independent since 1990, and Scotland is bigger than six of these 10. Each and every one of these nations has a seat at Europe's top table, a right they cherish, a right too that Scotland should embrace. Because being independent is the most natural thing in this world. It is what we seek as individuals for our own families. It's the point we take responsibility for our own future and our own success. We're able to speak with our own voice, choose our own direction and contribute in our own distinctive way. With independence, we stand on our own two feet, but we don't stand on our own. We gain a new, more modern relationship with the other nations of the, these islands, a true partnership of equals. A 21st century social union replacing a political union that's long past its sell-by date. It will require effort and commitment to make our country as good as we know it can be. A Scotland that is better than the one we have today. A more successful Scotland that we can pass on proudly to future generations. So let us now heed the words of the Patriot, Fletcher of Saltoon. Go forward into the community of nations to lend our own independent weight to the world. Sometimes the road you travel, it stays all up here. Let's work together. Come on, come on, let's work together. You know, together.